Hi, everyone. Welcome to Masterclass Live. This is our weekly series that allows you to connect directly and go deeper with our instructors. For those of you new to our community, Masterclass is a place where you can learn from the world's best. You can learn about writing a book, making a first class meal, or becoming a better negotiator. Our catalog has more than 80 classes with masters like Spike Lee, Natalie Portman, and David Sedaris. And today I'm so excited to welcome the incredible Anna Wintour to Masterclass Live. Anna has held the position of Editor-in-Chief for Vogue for more than three decades, was named the Artistic Director of Condé Nast in 2013, and most recently was appointed Global Content Advisor of Condé Nast. Last year, Anna graciously opened her doors to us and took us inside her world for her Masterclass on Creativity and Leadership. She's joined today by the incredible international editor at large at Vogue, Hamish Bowles, who's doing us the honor of interviewing Anna tonight and asking some of the questions you, our masterclass community, submitted for Anna to answer tonight. Anna and Hamish, welcome and thank you both for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you for having us. Good evening, Anna. I hope you're doing well. Hello, Hamish. <laughs> and uh, we're all broadcasting from uh, different locations given the current circumstances. Hamish, I have to say, I love your coordinated bow tie with your. Yes. Oh, thank you. I like a little bit of lilac in, in, in life and in clothing. <laughs> Well, without further ado, I'll let you both get to it and I'll see you in a bit. Thank okay, you. thank you. So, and I'm not going to ask you how many Zoom meetings you've been on today because I don't think I'm I will tell you it started at seven. So. Oh my God. I am going to ask you uh, whether there was something in particular that, that motivated you to want to teach a masterclass. Well, I think as, as you well know, Hamish, we are asked continuously both by young designers and students and young people who want to enter either the world of fashion design or fashion journalism or, or just journalism for advice and counsel and um, suggestions about how they might become part of, of the world that you and I love so much. So it felt to me that doing Masterclass, which does such a fantastic job, was an am amazing opportunity to share many of the things that, that I've learned over so many years, particularly when it comes to helping young designers and young uh, editors and young journalists, young photographers, everybody that works within our world about how they might uh, embark on a career. Mm. And I wonder um, why you decided to focus specifically on the on the ideas of creativity and, and leadership for the class? Well, I, I think that they're a very good pairing, that I think that if you are a leader, part of what you have to do is, is to recognize creativity and embrace creativity and also lead with it. I mean, I think when I look back on some of the initiatives that we've worked on so closely together, Hamish, over the years, and particularly um, something like the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund, which we've just repurposed uh, into a common thread, that, that came out of uh, you know, tragic circumstances after September the 11th, when we saw how hand to mouth the existence of young designers in New York really was, and, and how we wanted to really use our position, our platform at Vogue to help them. And now we are doing something very similar with a common thread, which is an initiative that Tom Ford, who is now president of the CFDA and the CFDA in Vogue, have started, I guess, about three months ago, right after we went into the pandemic, when we realized yet again how young designers and retailers and people within our industry were really not knowing how to pay the rent or how to get through the next few months when they had absolutely no revenue coming in. And we realized, of course, that we could not be a bailout. Thank God for Chuck Schumer and, and Nancy Pelosi, but we were at least able to help and to support and to raise money to, to give a degree of grants that would, would help them get through the next you know, very difficult time. How, how, did, how did that process come together? And, and what do you think are the lessons in that initiative for, for other leaders on how they could? Well, I think it's so important it. when yeah. things are difficult to take a leadership position. I think it's very, uh, 
it, it's, it's very important for the people that you work with and also for the industry that you work within to look at the landscape and think, where can I be the most helpful? What can I do to really uh, show the, the world that we work in, that we, we, we're there to help, we're there to support, we're there to give advice and there to give counsel. And the other very important thing to remember, as you well know, Hamish, is that you simply can't do these kind of huge initiatives by yourself, that you have to galvanize uh, the industry behind you so once we had decided that we wanted to repurpose the fashion fund into a common thread, we engaged uh, the CFDA, we engaged uh, everybody who works at Connie Nass that was able to help us and to support us. We did a video series, we raised the money and, and once it was announced, we were so, I was just so uh, overwhelmed to be honest by the generosity of, of Ralph Lauren who called me personally I think it was the day that it was announced in the New York Times that we were starting this initiative to, to help young designers and people within the industry that his foundation was going to give us a million dollars and it was just what we needed to make us believe in ourselves but also to have other people believe in what we were trying to do and within the, a few weeks after we announced it and we laid out the applications, we had well over a thousand applications, Hamish, to apply for these grants, which we now have raised over $5 million. And so what we had done in the meantime was ask 10, 10 leaders within our community, people from the retail business, designers, obviously people from Vogue and the CFDA, but a really strong mix of different uh, different areas of our, our of our industry who could really help us make a very difficult decision because to give grants, whether it was ten thousand dollars or I think our, our largest is going to be a hundred thousand dollars, you know that's not a decision that you want to make lightly, and it's not a decision that you want to make alone. And and how the how the applications been? I mean, what's what struck you? Well, I think if you are a young designer, and I hope to goodness that you're never in a situation like so many are in during this pandemic, but if you are in a situation where you do need to apply for a grant or you are applying for a position, whatever it may be, the most important thing is to prepare. Mm -hmm. And obviously the applications that have been thoughtful and careful and given us real data and numbers and a very clear explanation of where the grant, should they be given it, go, those are the applications that we're going to take far more seriously than those who sent in two lines with a smiley face. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it's such an inspiring initiative, as, as we'll all see uh, later from the videos <clears throat> of those in our fashion community who've been affected by the pandemic. Um, there's a video clip later in this program. Hi. 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 What's up? My name is Nicholas Aburn. I'm Anna Winter. Laura Kim. Tom Ford. Sydney Webb. I'm Bill Wilner. Alexander Wang. Libby Tong. And I'm the creative director, fashion designer, pattern maker, product development manager, the creative director, wholesale account manager. I'm an assistant designer. And the chairman of the Council of Fashion Designers of America. I would like to ask for your help in raising funds for the CFDA Vogue Fashion Fund Initiative, A Common Threat. Our goal with A Common Thread is not only to highlight all of the designers whom you know and love, but also focus on those individuals who keep our industry running. The challenges that we face are profound, but this fund, we hope, is a step in the right direction. Here we are in the house in quarantine. Our store and our office have been closed for two weeks. My three and a half year old black owned business is disappearing right before my eyes. Emotionally, it's it's definitely been stressful, confusing, isolating. So we just have our community and our customers and they're hurting just as much as we are right now. There's so much more to the fashion industry than what people see in magazines. All I ever wanted to do was to be a part of this industry. And, you know, I've been so blessed and humbled by the opportunities that it has given me. This is a perfect time to stop think, rethink, reinvent, and then reboot. 
we know we have to do a lot better and this is the right time to pause and think about how we can improve our industry. Everyone keeps saying like I can't wait for things to get back to normal. It's uh, I don't think there is a normal after this. I'm looking forward to the new normal. All the industry, all the designers, we need to get together to rethink what the new normal is. I think we can take that opportunity and learn as an industry that we are all in this together. I hope we come together as communities, as countries, and stand together to help each other get through this moment of darkness. I am convinced that we will come out of this together, more collaborative and more creative than ever before. My name is Jennifer Miller. My name is Shira Sukarmi. Darcy Gao. Joseph Altuzara. Victor Glamon. I'm Amy. Bacheva Hay. This is our common thread. And these are the stories of our community. Obviously, the current situation has changed the way we all communicate, both as a team and with the players in our, in our working world, and it's going to keep on changing. Um, with this in mind, we launched the first ever Vogue uh, Global Conversation series. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that initiative and its message of positive change in so many areas? It seems even more prescient given the situation we find ourselves in now. Yes, I mean, it's really so interesting, Hamish, because I think many of us, I know you certainly were one of them, have been talking for a while about how as an industry, we'd been somewhat stuck in this merry-go-round of fashion shows after fashion shows in, in different places all over the world. And as glamorous and wonderful as it might sound or, or seem to the outside world, it was also presenting incredible pressure on the creativity of the designers. It was a lot of pressure and expense for editors and retailers to fly all over the world to see these collections. And also there's a pressure when the actual clothes get into the stores or onto the e-commerce sites, wherever it may be, for them to sell quickly because right behind them was another collection waiting to be delivered. And I think we were all saying, we need to slow down, this is not good for climate this is not good for the environment this is really frankly not good for creativity it's not good for for anything that we believe in it isn't it isn't in step with the values of today so i think once the pandemic hit and we all had to find a computer and um move somewhere that would be safe and actually started to have some time to really think and i know you must have been asked i've been certainly asked a million times what is this going to mean for fashion moving forward? And it seemed to me that, oh, there are all these people all over the world that work in our world that are thinking exactly this, and I know they're at home. So let's get them on a Zoom. Let's have these global conversations spearheaded by Vogue, and let's understand what people in the retail business, what people in the design business, what people from all different areas who work within fashion are thinking and how can we open up the conversation to understand what direction we we might go in and obviously whatever direction we're going to go in in the next few months is going to be a transition phase but again i think that this is something that those of you who are listening at home might take to heart when you are in a difficult situation it's very important to ask others what they're thinking and to have a real honest exchange of ideas and see how you can figure everything out together. And I, I don't know what you think, Hamish, but I, I felt that the conversation that Edward Ennefel, the editor-in-chief of British Vogue, had with Mark Jacobs, which uh, the creative director of Mark Jacobs, that started the Vogue Global Conversations off was actually one of the most revealing because it was so honest. I mean, there were two key members of our world really talking about a situation that neither of them been in before and asking each other for support and help and advice and suggestions. Yes, I agree. I think, I think those conversations were so unvarnished. And I think there's also something about this, this format that kind of encourages that sort of frank speaking. And I think, um, you know, particularly Mark, feeling so kind of vulnerable and kind of angry and, and frightened and uncertain about everything, but really coming through with that message that creativity is never going to, 
die. And, you know, he's certainly turned it on himself in this most amazing, joy, joyful way. So, um, yeah, I think that, that the message of creativity never stopping is, is kind of wonderful. Yes, and in the end, that's, that's what fuels everything that, that we do. And I think that he was feeling particularly um, uh, vulnerable, as, as you say, because he, he didn't have his team around him and he's someone who relies very much on being surrounded by people who will challenge him and make him think and question. And he needs that support system in order to create his collections. And then on a, the other side of the coin, I was in conversation uh, with my our dear friend, John Galliano, who is someone that can work in a very solitary way and is, um, comfortable in that environment and I'm not saying for one second that one is right and the other is wrong but it, it just shows you that two very brilliant designers who are absolutely you know, the most revered in their field have very separate ways of working very different ways of working and and neither is right or neither is wrong it's just everybody finds the path to creativity in in their own in their own way but what what I loved about the conversations was uh, how you felt how much they they missed designing and creating and in the end what they wanted was their clothes their designs to be seen yes yeah it was very uplifting the the, the message that came through everything and I think we also I think it was who who interviewed Stella was it uh Stella McCartney. It was um, the editor from Spain. Yes, yeah. You know, I think at one point we had editors from India and Russia and uh, China, and China, all on at the same time. So they were truly global. But I, I, I thought was what was also so moving about hearing from Stella is that she, Stella McCartney, who is a designer who has said in her in her own words that for many years she felt she was a rather lonely voice. Uh, uh, you know, obviously speaking up always for climate change and sustainability. And now, obviously, the world is, is joining forces with her and, and she is welcoming them with open arms. And I think as we emerge out of the situation that we're in right now, that sense of wanting to invest by, be connected with a designer, a brand, that has meaning and has values that you can connect to is, is so important. Absolutely. Um, in, the, in the class, you invited cameras into Vogue's uh, editorial process for the March 2019 issue. Students were able to see you kind of run and manage fashion and editorial meetings for that issue, the whole sort of process. How has that process changed or been affected by this pandemic? Uh, and how's it, how's it, <laughs> how did, uh, how did the June, July issue come together? Well, uh, it, it was obviously, we had a very different issue as, as you know, in mind, um, before the pandemic hit and everybody had to shelter at home. But I, I think it really demonstrates the strength of the incredible team, yourself obviously included, Hamish, that we, we have at Bow because once we had adjusted to the situation and uh, learned to, to, to live through meetings and conversations like the one that you and I are having right now, it was very clear to us that this was a moment that we had not experienced before. And that I think we all felt deeply, strongly, passionately that it was Vogue's role to reflect what was happening, whether you were a, a designer or a, a writer or a photographer or a videographer or an international editor at large, that we wanted to understand and report and reflect the moment. And so we asked our worlds from all over the world to really either write or um, photograph or take a video or do something that we could use both on all our platforms, whether it was print or digital or on video to create 
the atmosphere that we're all living in right now and also to write about it and, and what it meant if you worked in the theater or if you worked in fashion or if you worked, if you were an artist, like how this was affecting you creatively, from a creative point of view. And also, we also very much wanted to talk about the young designers that we are supporting through a common thread. And so as a result, we had all these amazing pieces of journalism and heartbreaking images that we were able to collect in an issue that I strongly feel, I hope that you, Hamish, would agree, is going to be a collector's item. Because when you look through it, it does summon up the loneliness and the heartbreak and the sense of looking out on a world that you feel is you can no longer grasp, but also a sense of belonging through family and children and uh, creativity. So it was this extraordinary eye on a world that uh, is unlike anything you know, except maybe those that have lived through 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 wars or uh, other extraordinary experiences have know about, and it was also a big big discussion about what should we do for for the cover, and we tried out a lot of the images, but we had decided that the the logo for a common thread would be a rose, and I honestly can't remember if it was Phyllis or if it was Raoul who thought we should go back into our archives to you know, the, our greatest contributor ever, Irving Penn, and see if there was an unpublished image that we could use for the cover. And by some miracle, as we were going through what was, had not been seen, there was a red rose, which was our symbol for a common thread. So here we are. Yes. <laughs> Beautiful. No, I, I find it absolutely extraordinary and it's already been, um, you know, talked about in so many different publications as being an image that just was such a standout image. So I think it shows that when things are difficult, that's when you have to be really your most creative. I mean, how have you found it, Hamish? I know you've taken up cooking. <laughs> yes, I mean, I've, um, you know, looking at my calendar for this week, I think I was meant to be in Kenya. Um, oh, right, walking with the elephants. Walking with the elephants, Kenya, Doha, um, Capri, Puglia, maybe a stop in London on the way back. Now I have a kind of four block radius if I'm feeling particularly adventurous. So um, it's, a, it's a challenge, but yes, I've, I've focused on my kitchen. Um, from someone who didn't know how to light a cooker. That's a big, that's a big leap forward. But um, so, uh, you know, and I, actually I found the time to kind of stop and think about things has been incredibly useful in a way. Yes, yes. But as you said earlier, you know, we were on this crazy schedule and... Yes, I think been... you, you more than any of us. <laughs> I mean, you just never, never stop. But for those who, who are watching, may, who may not be as familiar with some of the adventures that Hamish has been on. Maybe you might want to tell some stories about a couple of the ones that you've been on in the past, like the Survivor one was one of my oh. particular favorites. Yes, yes, I think some wag at the office. Might have been you, Anna. No, I thought, never. <laughs> I thought it would be a great idea to take me out of my comfort zone and send me on an outdoor survival school in Southern Utah with uh, with wild bears and um, mosquitoes and flash floods and all that, that kind of thing. So I, I kind of survived it for a week. I mean, I did, I, I completed the course. I was very proud of myself. Um, that was, that was followed by, um, <laughs> that was followed being signed up for an X Factor audition, which I think probably is the single most terrifying experience of my entire life. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm not well, sure. You didn't, you didn't get, how far did you get? I'm trying to rem remember. I mean, I got most of the way through my song before, <laughs> before the hand shot up. <laughs> well, it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to, to, to read about. And I, and I, I think it's very, 
you know, in, in a world where previously it was so easy just to drop by somebody's office or, you know, pass them in the corridor and have a, a quick talk and, and, and meetings where we could exchange ideas, it's very important in difficult situations like the one that we're all living right now to remain closely in touch with your teams and really to connect with them as much as you possibly can, either, you know, obviously via via zoom meetings or through email but connection is really important i i think you can't let people uh drift away too much into their own own thing because it is such an extraordinary circumstance that people are not so used to and i think for those possibly that are living alone it's also you know it's quite frightening and it's quite solitary so that i think the human connection as much as you can possibly offer it is very is very important and that people feel listened to and the other the other lesson that i've learned is that you can just drift all day on these meetings and never go outside or never switch off and you you, you also have to encourage the people that you work with to disconnect and mm. take whatever i don't know what a vacation is during a <laughs> pandemic but to take to take time to yourselves whether it's it's uh, cooking or uh, learning the piano or whatever it is you might may be engaging with yourself spiritually in a different kind of a way from the day-to-day -day work that we we have to do in such a different way mm. So Anna, uh, Masterclass have received hundreds of wonderful questions for you from their community. Uh, I wish we could get to all of them, but we're going to try and get to as many as possible. Okay. So let's start with um, Kian in Los Angeles, who asks, uh, what is the best means of showing creative prowess in an interview or resume? I'm so glad we have that question, because I'm going to let you answer that question Hamish because I remember vividly our very first interview <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> well in my defense and up front I'm gonna say <laughs> I, was, I was a 21 year old club kid stylist um, you have just come to British Vogue mm -hmm. I had a, a very um, gender fluid approach to dressing and your lovely assistant Gabby had told you that you had to meet me and I, and I arrived for the interview <laughs> And she, she kind of looked absolutely stricken, at, stricken at me. I mean, the colour drained from her face. And she said, it's incredibly hot in Anna's office. I think you might want to give me your jacket. <laughs> I thought it was really bizarre. I said, no, no, I'm, I'll keep it on. I, you know, I have um, a resistance to these things. And she said, well, at least let me take your purse. <laughs> so I handed her my Chanel handbag. And then I, I sort of said, <laughs> waltzed into your office with some trepidation only to discover that you were wearing exactly the same Chanel jacket as I was. So, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the message is. Stay true to yourself, I think, because I, I didn't get the job, but I don't think you forgot me. No, certainly not. And I, I think the lesson, the lesson I learned from that, that meeting is never let, um, never let the, the, the true creative stars slip away. And I don't think that I had the right position for Hamish at the time, but it's true, I never forgot him. And I also understood, you know, from observing and watching and getting to know Hamish over many, many years that he is someone that you have to really treasure and understand, you know, the enormous uh, gifts that he brings to a title like Vogue, which are way beyond doing what he has to do right now, which is staying in one place. And that you have to understand that there are people that you just simply can't put in a box uh, because they will not flourish. And you have to let them spread their wings and, and follow their heart and, their, and their, their passions. And then they will bring back real magic to what you're doing and and to have true creativity i think you have to be able to recognize the, that kind of talent well <laughs> thank you <laughs> i'm quite verklempt um let's move swiftly to sarah in london who asks um you talk in your class about being decisive um 
how did you craft such strong courage in your convictions, as it were? Was this something um, that you had throughout your career and how did you kind of come well, to I it, think, admire it? Yeah, the, uh, thank you for asking that. I mean, I, I think I was, grew up in a, in a family of journalists. My, my mother was a, was a film critic and my father was a, uh, a newspaper editor. And at that time, there were maybe 10, 12 editions of a paper every single day, if you can believe it. I guess it's a little bit similar to what we're doing now, except they all had to be produced physically. And I saw him making decisions on you know, an hourly basis. And, the clear, and he was very clear in, in, in the directions that he was giving his journalists and his editors. And I, always saw how much he was admired and what a great paper he produced and also how people responded so much better to something that they could understand even if it was a no and they disagreed at least they 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 knew where they were and what the param parameters were and I in my career have worked for people that have been very decisive and I found that very uh, much easier to work for than people that would change their minds and, and not be clear. So I, I think it's a combination of, of having a, a father who was so decisive and worked in the world that, you know, I eventually worked in and, and also having experienced both sides and understanding if you're, if you're working for someone, clarity is, is a real gift, I think. Mm. Um. Well, that's what I've experienced for <laughs> 27 years, and it certainly is, yes. Clarity and directness, um, no gray areas. Um, Maria uh, Jose in London, Canada, London, Canada asks, how are you spending your days in the past months and what have you learned about being at home? Well, I've been very fortunate that I have, um, a home on Long Island and I've been able to see spring in a way that I have never ever seen before. So I've spent when I'm, I'm not here in this room working, I spent a lot of time walking around the garden, looking at uh, daffodils and um, wisteria now is extraordinary. The lilacs are amazing. And just because when we arrived here, everything was brown and uh, cold and dark and and now it's light at five o'clock and it's staying light now until eight fifteen. and just really uh, seeing a garden open has been uh, an extraordinary gift so I've loved that and I'm also very fortunate in that I'm sheltering at home with my daughter and my daughter-in-law and my two granddaughters and my son-in-law so I've been an I've been very lucky to be able to spend time with them. And I understand listening to a lot of the, the, the team at Condé Nast at Vogue, how much everybody is enjoying the family time and, and how many of them are saying they would prefer to continue working remotely or at least part, partly remotely. So I think it's been, I do think it's been a time for reflection and I think it's been a time to, understand what's important in your life. And I, I think that we have spent a lot of time running too fast. I mean, I don't know what you think, Hamish. Um, I think just that, yes. I mean, I've kind of loved my schedule and the craziness of it and being on a plane a couple of times a week and so on. But I mean, it has, in lots of ways, it's sort of been amazing <laughs> sitting still and as you, as you, say seeing seeing spring spring uh in this city which i like you i really haven't seen for oh, and the blossom unbelievable it's wonderful so oh esther in los angeles asks um and we've touched on this a little what direction is fashion heading in the future i i think that that's a question that right now is impossible to answer i definitely think that people are focusing on slowing down and uh, being as creative as they possibly can and talking to readers, to audiences, to customers about the value of fashion and, and less about it being disposable, that fashion can mean emotion, it can be about memories, it could be something that you can 
give to your son, to your daughter. It, it doesn't mean it's something that you should just wear, wear, wear one time. I mean, I, I feel that uh, we really need to think about sustainability and the environment and, and what this industry means to, to, to the world going forward. So in that, to answer that question, I think everybody that works in our world is using this time to move forward in a better way. But in the immediate future, I, I think we're just going to be looking at a period of time for a year, maybe two years, that will be very transition. And as we emerge, there'll be a clearer path. But I don't believe for one second anybody has the answer, the full answer to your question right now. Right. Um, Melissa in Washington, D.C. asks, um, can you, well, we've sort of covered this, I suppose, can you supply any tips on how to compartmentalize in a healthy way work life and home <laughs> personal life? I guess it's your garden, right? Your beautiful garden. My garden is a, is a, is a, great, is a great joy, but I, I think to anybody embarking on a career, I think it is dangerous and uh, maybe overwhelming only to immerse yourself in your work. And I also think if you have, as Hamish does, a, a very, a, a life apart, a very full life apart from your work, whether it involves uh, the theater or film or books or what it, music, whatever it may be, that is only gonna inform your work and make, make it more interesting and more full because I think everything that you absorb and see and learn about and, and listen to, you know, reappears in, in, in another way. So I, I think a balance is incredibly important. Right. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid we're, we're now at our last question. Okay. Um, it might be a penultimate one because I, I have a quick question for you. Um, um, uh, Ginny in Winter Park, Florida asks, um, what is the one piece of advice you wish you had never heard or that you completely ignored? Um, that's an interesting question that, that I wish that I had ignored. Yes, or that you had ignored. Oh, that I did ignore. Well, you know the Madonna story, I think. <laughs> yes, I was um, sat next to a rather pompous person um, who inquired about what I did. And I said, um, oh, I, I, you know, I work at Vogue. And he said, oh, I love Vogue. I think of Vogue as being, you know, Audrey Hepburn and Catherine Hepburn and Princess Grace. And it's, it's, a, it's a title or it's a magazine that would never put Madonna on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember it was right at the time that we were actually photographing Madonna and that uh, for her first Vogue cover. And there were many after that. And we were so thrilled to have her. And that made me more determined than ever to put Madonna on the cover. So. <laughs> Um, and, and a last question: um, Do you have a do you have a favourite memory or moment from from your masterclass? Well, I I love talking to uh, masterclass. Well, it was a it was a fascinating and very enjoyable experience. But I love talking to masterclass about uh, the fashion fund and to explain how important it is. I think for all of us at Vogue to understand what. Uh, a young generation is thinking we learn from them just as much as they may learn from us and to understand what they're thinking and how they're designing and you know what their inspirations might be and uh, just just meeting them and 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 being part of their world and uh, and seeing where they live and how they design and seeing their passion and their enthusiasm and their uh, their sense of hope is is that is just a, a wonderful gift. And then, of course, sadly, not this year, but uh, in years past, I, I mean, I always love to talk about the Met and how important the work of brilliant Andrew Bolton is to us at Vogue and, and how, again, we're so inspired by his mind and how he sees fashion in a historical context and how he tells his stories and how we can bring worlds that might not necessarily go into the Met looking for 
an exhibition that is about um, Poiret or Scaparelli or uh, punk, but stumbles on it and really learns something and, and enjoys it. So I think those are two initiatives, initiatives um, that we all work on at Vogue that I think everybody there really feels so, I think feels very, so that they are a very special part of the world that we that we work in. That of course producing the magazine, whether it's print, digital, or video, is is our, is is vital to what we do. But I think one of the wonderful things about being at Vogue, and I know Hamish, seeing how you work and what you do, I think that what's so extraordinary about Vogue is it can give you a platform to help others in so many different ways and to learn from others in so many different ways and to cross into so many different worlds. Yes, I completely agree. Um, thank you, Anna. It's been, it's been wonderful talking to you. And, um, and now, uh, alas, our time is up and I'm going to hand you over to Chasmeet. And I'm Hamish. Uh, it was Hamish. so fun and such an important conversation. I love the image, Hamish, of a 21-year-old club kid as you were wearing a Chanel coat. Do you have any photos from that time? I'm afraid there are. There that was is, pre, pre, pre everybody <laughs> photographing all the time. Pre, pre Instagram. There's right. one. There's one club picture lurking on the internet. I'm trying, trying to get my hands on it. And Anna, I love what you said about you know when things are difficult, taking a leadership position. That was I remember such a big theme in your class and. I love that you are just living your words and showcasing that right now with the global conversations and a common thread. Uh, thank so thank you both so much for, for taking the time. Uh, Anna, I wanna leave you with one last question. Uh, you mentioned earlier your, the work of your father at a Fleet Street newspaper and how he influenced you greatly. I'm wondering what are the lessons he taught you that are most resonating with you right now, particularly working you know, in journalism? Well, I... I saw his love for what he did and how much he cared about the people that worked with him and um, and how excited he was by by the people that he worked with and and about telling stories and putting out the news and and being at the the, the center I mean he was working on a newspaper so at the center of culture at the center of politics uh, and really, I learned from him a sense of doing the right thing and really trusting your instincts and also being able to trust the people that you work with and letting them make decisions for themselves and, and knowing that they will work better with you if they understand that you trust them. Great. Well, thank you guys so much um, for taking the time to be here. And thank you to everyone who's joined us today. For those of you who are Masterclass members, we're teaming up with Anna for a special challenge called Lead with a Vision that gives you a chance to win a signed copy of that 2020, uh, June 2020 edition of Vogue. Anna, you mentioned that's probably going to be a collector's edition uh, years from now. So this is a great chance to submit, submit for the contest and receive that copy. Just head over to the community page and share a story of how you've led with the vision and we plan to announce the winners the week of June 15th. Masterclass Live takes place this time every Wednesday, and our next guest is one of the greatest dancers of all time, Misty Copeland. Anna Hamish, thank you so much.